This will be the second part of the, um, the series where we started the first part entitled COVID-19, The Choice Between Fear and Faith. And so um, here we are. I mean, we are moving right along with this time of um, great panic and fear that has swept the earth. And so <clears throat> um, I hope to speak to you and encourage you and help equip you with the word today so you can, you can be an overcomer uh, with what's coming ahead. You must understand that everything about your life has changed. Nothing's going to be the same. Everything over the last few weeks has changed, and it will never be the same. And it, it, some of us, I've, you know, I've talked to, to some friends and some people from my past, and many people think that uh, we're just going to bounce out of this and things will be back to normal. And um, this is the beginning of the new normal. And this is the beginning of the new way, the new social equality, a gradual new communism brought on by years of social programming, readying us to love our new system of slavery, now finally coming into full view with 2020 vision. This new world of chaos we have found ourselves in here at the beginning of 2020 is the Antichrist world system gradually, gradually revealing itself. I don't think it is by chance that this is mushrooming around the entire world during the biblical new year and the very start of the biblical feasts which start with passover and the feast of unleavened bread if you call yourself a christian you have just come to a true crossroad whether you understand it or not passover is the trailhead the major event that prompted the journey of the release of israel from pharaoh's slavery system just like then we are now at the very moment in time where you will have to decide if you will take the narrow trail or stay with the masses on the broad road that leads to destruction. You will all need to embrace the journey of leanness, every one of us, the journey of leanness, or you will be the apostates that turn back to Pharaoh for peace, safety, and bread out of fear, which, may, which many will serve due to self-preservation. What we are seeing around the world with the COVID-19 will not make any sense unless viewed through the promise of prophetic scripture. You must know that this response by world governments under the illusion of helping and caring for the people is furthering many of the goals set up by the United Nations agenda for global government. What every American needs to know is that the recently passed $2.2 trillion stimulus package will further burden you under the yoke of bondage and the slavery as the working populace that will be further indebted to its government. It might not be an immediate tax burden on the individual. But even worse than that is that it gives the government an opportunity to take an equity stake in many of the companies they're going to bail out. These plans give big publicly traded companies billions to keep the lights on and keep the workers on the payroll. In exchange, the government would get stock ownership. This is just one more step in the direction of global ownership by the United, United Nations government that seeks to control all world economies as our taskmasters in this hour. This also further conditions us to accept the handouts of big government. Every time there's a bubble in the economy created by the last recession bailouts. These stimulus packages, these plans do not correct the economy, but only make things worse for the future of the economy by giving us short-term false highs to keep up the charade of wealth, which is really only a debt consumerism. Materialism made possible only by more credit with only more interest given under the guise of helping us, which only drives us deeper into oppression. But the believer must understand that Yahweh, our Creator, allows this oppression to happen so that His people will cry out for salvation. Just as happened in Egypt under Pharaoh's increased oppression, be at peace knowing that Yahweh is totally in control. Everything will happen just as He promised and His enemies will be caught in their very own trap, falling in the very pit they have dug for us. Take heart. This isn't over yet. But it has just begun. How many people do, will do whatever their leaders tell them if they are afraid of losing Monday night football, all-you-can-eat pizza buffets, and the steady diet of Hollywood programmed entertainment, and not to mention the promise of protection from war, famine, and death that they will surely offer for your obedience? If you consider yourself a believer, this is a merciful plea from Abba. How many more chances will you have to repent uh, of sin and the sin of your involvement with the enemy of your Creator? How, many much, how much more time will you have to get your house in order? both physically and spiritually. How much more time will you have to become the disciple of Yeshua, not just a casual observer wearing a cross on a t-shirt? Life as we always know it stopped this year, 2020, and nothing will ever be the same. You can take that to the bank. A time of leanness, a time of leanness is coming to everyone on this earth, and nobody will escape it. Nobody will be raptured out of it 
ahead of the, the tribulation. Nobody will be whisked away to heaven and preserved while it's being poured on the earth, as it is Yah's mercy to try His church by fire, at least the ones who say that they're His. He will try you by fire. None of your plans for prosperity will save you. Silver and gold will witness against you if you store it for the last days of survival. You will not be in control this time. Maybe all the times in your life you've been in control, and I've controlled my life many years uh, in the past, or thought I did. You won't have any control over what's coming. So I hope to encourage and equip you, those of you who are true believers, or even if you hope to be a true believer, um, with the Word. Equip you with the words that you will not fear the coming chaos, but would rather have a faith explosion as the Word opens up and you see just how close we are to the very turn of our Savior. He's coming. And it is, he's coming. It's, he's drawing nigh. So, with this understanding of our current atmosphere, it is not by chance that we have set before us the example of the first time Israel was released from Egypt. Physical Egypt, as the shadow event, teaches us much regarding the days ahead for all who will leave spiritual Egypt by faith to serve the living and true God. This is part two of the message titled COVID-19, The Choice of Faith and Fear. If you've not seen that, I suggest you watch that before you get into this message because we're going to be building on that foundation and going forward with, uh, with what we saw in Egypt, physical Egypt in, in Exodus. So we left off in part one with all the plagues of Egypt being fully poured out, which are types of the seal and trumpet judgments of Yeshua's revelation. Exodus chapters 12 and 13 detail the institution of the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. With Passover season upon us, I don't find it by chance that we're actually finding ourselves quarantined. Some in lockdown, total lockdown, and ordered to shelter in place. As I was preparing for the part two of this message, I was prompted not to move on to Exodus 14 without sharing more details revealed in Exodus 12 and 13. The, since both of these feasts reveal the only true way of salvation and the only true path leading out of Egypt, you will not understand this present time without those examples being fully understood. So we have to get into the Passover. In early 2019, Abba placed a Passover message in my heart, and you can find it on my, on my YouTube um, uh, page. It's titled, Passover, the Trailhead of the Narrow Way. He has been teaching us to personally embrace the journey of the narrow way over the last few years. I believe in preparation for the very time and season that we have just entered into with this new world order coming into fruition before our very eyes. If Passover is the trailhead, and I will explain that more in detail, and you can also see that more in detail if you look at that message, then the Feast of Unleavened Bread is the narrow way. There are two separate events, and I hope to show that to you as we get into this, this series. Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread are two specific events for two specific things. Passover, the trailhead to the narrow way. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is the narrow way. Many people will soon be deciding whether to continue along the narrow path of faith, willingly laying their lives down for truth and obedience to their master, or the one that they claim is their master, or they'll choose the easy wide road of selfish, selfish, self-flesh preservation and be given the great delusion due to the rebellion against the truth while refusing to obey the one they have claimed to believe in it will become easier and easier to deny Jesus before men as they turn from the truth to serve fear to serve Pharaoh the world call the word calls that calls this the falling away and you'll see that in 2nd Thessalonians 2 starting in verse 1 now we beseech you brethren by the coming of our Lord Yeshua and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Yeshua is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The very Antichrist we're talking about. The first thing to see here is that men will try and deceive us diff by different means, um, that Yeshua's return is happening any minute now. We are not to be shaken or troubled by false reports from false prophets who twist Scripture to sell salvation. The son of perdition will be revealed, but before he is revealed, we will experience a falling away like it's never happened. I believe we have been in this state for quite some time, with the seeds of the falling away seeded many generations in our past. The word for falling away is apost apostasia. Apostasia. It literally means a def defection from truth. It is also directly tied to another word, apostasion. Apostasion, which means divorce or written divorcement. 
These trials are specifically used by Yahweh as a sifting of many who will become apostates, divorcing from the truth because of a spiritual deception that is given to them out of a refusal to obey and love the full truth. It will become harder for every professing Christian in the days ahead because everything that can be shaken from your life will be shaken and only what can't be shaken will remain. Your true fruit will come forward. Hebrews 12, 25. See that you refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape, if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake, not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Listen, the flesh, the idols of our flesh, are getting ready to be shaken off the earth. The, the, the wood, the hay, the straw, everything that can burn, every work that you and I have done, every idle word we've given, everything that is not lasting by the word of Yah is getting ready to be demolished. And only His word will remain. All flesh is grass. That's what the Bible teaches, and only His Word will remain. I believe that the falling away, this divorcement of truth, will start with fear. In Exodus 19, Israel feared as slaves before the presence of Yahweh when He revealed Himself as fire on the mountain. And if you haven't looked at that, go back and read the, that starting in Exodus 19. Um, many today are still slaves of sin, slaves of their flesh, and like before, we will, will refuse to hear from Him when He speaks this time from heaven, when He comes shaking everything that can be shaken. It's important that you hear Him. It's important that you, if you, especially if you call yourself a believer, will hear Him when He speaks from heaven this time. When you start seeing everything shaken, you start seeing the dominoes of your idols fall. It's very important that you don't run in fear as a slave, where you stop your ears and say, I'm not going to hear from him. Moses, you tell us what he says, and we'll do whatever he says. We'll just do it. Just don't kill us. No, it's going to be sonship this time. You're going to have to run right up into the fire, into the arms of Daddy this time, by faith. You're going to have to trust that he will catch you. See, fear will keep you from answering like sons and obeying the truth, knowing that faith will command action. A lifestyle change, a total dying of your flesh. True faith will sacrifice your wants and your desires as you walk with Him separated from this world, separated from sin, separated from the friends and the family and or anyone who openly blasphemes the truth, mocking the very living Son of God by remaining in the life of sin which He came to separate you from by His own blood. What a travesty. With all of this in mind, all of this in mind, we will continue to examine our current events through the lenses of the prophetic bookends of Egypt's past, the shadow, physical Egypt and Israel's leaving Egypt, and Egypt today, spiritual Egypt, which is our reality, the dark covering that's cast over the entire earth, that's only pulled back when the brightness of the sun is revealed from heaven. In this part two, we will explore the first Passover and what it reveals regarding the full release from Pharaoh's kingdom. The Passover event being the culmination of all the plagues of Egypt and our separation and way of salvation before his wrath is fully poured out upon Pharaoh and the entire earth soon to come. We're going to get there. We are then going to take a deeper dive in part three into the Feast of Unleavened Bread in this series. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is our seven-day journey of refinement, the dying of our flesh, where we accept the bread of leanness for our journey out of spiritual Egypt. See, that's going to be a choice, this choice between faith and fear. Faith is going to be you choosing the narrow path. Faith is going to be you choosing the bread of leanness. And we're going to really dive into that in part three. You won't want to miss it. There were some pretty amazing instructions given for Passover, and each pregnant with future fulfillment in Yeshua. We will examine these in light of Yeshua and what we need to know as the reality of these will soon be fully birthed right before our very eyes. This will not be a fully detailed Passover teaching that would take a lot of time. There is so much to understand, but a quick view of what these shadows represent will be needful going forward for all who have been taught Easter eggs and Easter ham instead of bitter herbs in the blood of the lamb. Let's focus on a few key, few key points that is going to help. We're going to start in Exodus 12, verse 3. 
Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening of the fourteenth day. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. So it's the lentils, the door posts of their homes, they're going to strike it with the blood of the lamb. And we'll dig into that. In this final plague in Egypt, Yahweh is going to have all of Israel take a spotless lamb, bring it into their very homes as part of the family, then kill it. This was a very close up and personal for every member in the family. Then they would take the blood of the lamb and sprinkle its blood upon the upper post and the side post of their home. So the first key, the first key we're going to look at is choosing the unblemished lamb, choosing the spotless lamb. Many of you are going to know, or you should know, if you know your Bibles, that, that that's talking about none other than Yeshua. So we're really going to dive into what this means to take the Lamb. John 1.29 The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Many years ahead of the first Passover, John, the immerser, the Baptist, the baptizer, would pronounce the Lamb of Yah, Yeshua, had arrived to take away the sins of the world. This is none other than Emmanuel, God with us. In Egypt, the type of our slavery to sin, they were instructed to kill a lamb, use its blood upon all the doorposts of their homes, and then to devour all of it, which we're going to read. Yeshua is the reality of that lamb, who destroyed the law of sin and death for all who have taken His blood for salvation, and have been filled with the, His Holy Spirit, Yahweh's Holy Spirit, which is His grace, His grace given to walk his path. You can't walk His path without it. Know ye not, you are the temples of the Holy Spirit, if His Spirit dwells in you. And that's going to be a whole different teaching. The Lamb's blood was to be applied with hyssop, used as the paintbrush. So they would take a hyssop branch and they would dip it into the basin. Exodus 12, 22 is where we find this. It says, And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop, and dip it into the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel, strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. See, there's very specific instructions in the Passover. There's very specific instructions in all of Yahweh's Word. You just have to read that and read them. Be filled with His Spirit and ask Him to help decipher and discern His Word. And He will reveal it to you. It's very, um, if you have a Spirit in you, and you can understand, then you can understand His Word. You don't need to go buy books, tons and tons of books. You just need to know His Word. Hyssop was understood to have a cleansing ability, and especially in ancient, the ancient far Middle East and Far East, uh, ancient Israel. Um, a cleansing ability, uh, uh, which was also used later in Leviticus 19.18. You can see in Leviticus 19.18, it was used to cleanse those who had come in contact with the uncleanness of a corpse. Now, all the law was given. Again, for examples, everything in the Old Testament was given for examples. And they're all about Yeshua. If anyone tries to teach anything other than that, they are false. Because everything is about Him. Everything. He made everything. All, all things were made for Him and by Him. And He gets the glory. This being a shadow of the cleansing blood of Yeshua, whose blood heals us from sin and death. That's what that corpse represented. So in ancient Israel, under the law, you would come and touch a corpse, be around the dead corpse, and you would be unclean until you did the, the, the cleansing, the ceremony of the cleansing. You can find more about, on that in Ex, uh, Leviticus 19.18. <clears throat> we, we too are born into sin, the blood of unclean man flowing in our veins. Yeshua offers a blood transfusion, spiritually. His blood in exchange for ours. His clean blood in exchange for our human, tainted, sinful blood. Yeshua offers us this blood transfusion, His blood, cleansing us from the inside out as we are released now from the cycle of sin and death. Hyssop was also used in the cleansing of the leper, according to the instructions given in Leviticus 14. And if you look back at the last message, we talked about the leprosy and it being definitely a type and shadow of sin that only Yeshua, deity, 
could come and heal us from. So let's look at the second key point. Second key point here is Exodus 12:8. This is huge. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna, ha we're gonna hammer this one. They shall eat the flesh in that night. What flesh? The the lamb. They shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. All of his innards, all of his internal organs. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, you shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is Yahweh's Passover. You're getting ready to go on a journey. That journey is going to be the journey along the narrow way. This is the entrance. This is the ceremonial um, covenantal agreement where you take the blood of the lamb and then you eat it. The second key is eating the entire lamb, <clears throat> along, along with bitter herbs. This was not a pleasurable dining experience as exemplified in the modern day satyrs of Judaism. With a party atmosphere and the wine flowing so much that many people can't drive home afterwards because they're totally drunk. I speak of the four cups of blessing that the Pharisees added to the Passover ceremony. Here's the first article that came up about Passover drinking. I just googled it, Passover drinking. This guy says, what makes this night different from all other nights? You are about to get drunk. Yes, at a Passover Seder, you have to drink. And the operative word here is have to. Oh, shucks. See, we Jewish people are so smart that we created a holiday in which you're obligated to drink four glasses of wine with dinner. For some of us, that's just a typical Monday night. For others, it means a guaranteed Tuesday hangover. Well, I hope you caught the, uh, the very telling words that this man says. See, we Jewish people are so smart that we created a holiday in which you're obligated to drink four glasses of wine with dinner. And that's exactly what happened. They created this, this um, hypocrisy wrapped up in what they call the Passover. It has, that has nothing really to do with, with the Passover of the Bible. Why? Because Yeshua is not in it. They do not see him in it is they've added things to it, they've taken things away from it. You will not find anything in the Bible about four glasses of wine being the glasses of blessing. Um, but they will very much ignore the New Testament covenantal meal that Yeshua had with his disciples where he takes the cup. Um, and we'll, we'll read about that in a little bit. Not only that, not only that, but they have created special Seder plates, that's what they call this Passover meal, the, the dinner, the Passover, Passover Seder. They've taken the created special Passover Seder plates to feature a boiled egg of fertility. It is so hypocritical to see many messianic folks bashing Christians for Easter eggs on Facebook as they then invite them to a Passover celebration which involves them in the exact same fertility rooted rituals. <sighs> There's a lot of deception, people. I hope you'll just read the word. It's very simple. <clears throat> the path that followers of Yeshua follow is strictly biblical with no allowance for adding and subtracting from truth like the Jewish Mishnah and the Jewish Talmud command in which many in the Hebrew roots and Messianic communities adhere to. Go back and look at what Yeshua says at the end of Revelation about those who add and take away from the Word. Very serious. For all who have been given the heart of obedience, they will stay on the narrow path of Yeshua, staying out of the ditches of both modern Jewish paganism on the Passover side and modern Christian paganism on the Easter side. And there's a whole lot of teaching on that, just right out of the Word, but that's not for this, this time. So no, the spirit of Passover was not what we see in today's traditions. All of the lamb was roasted, legs, head, and internal organs. It was not to be boiled with water to tenderize it and make it taste better. Uh, it wasn't salted. It wasn't given barbecue sauce. It was not to be eaten with fresh baked leavened bread, but unleavened bread. This was a meal of necessity, eaten in haste, Haste, meaning you're ready for a journey. Uh, they kept their shoes on and their staff in the hand, and nothing could be left until morning. Just as the manna from heaven in the future, during their journey uh, into the promised land, the, the, the manna from heaven would be filled with maggots and stink by sunrise, which is very symbolic of our getting fresh word daily, the fresh bread from heaven daily, and all that was not consumed would be burned away with the new sunrise. It's very important that you and I eat the word daily for ourselves daily. This also speaks of eating the Word to overflowing in preparation for your journey of faith. You're going to need all of it. 
This journey of faith, you're going to need to be overfilled and overflowing with the entire lamb. This Passover was not festive. It was not a happy occasion, but it was done circumspectly. Understanding that this was the covenantal meal of agreement where you would accept the lamb for your salvation to be ready to leave Egypt at his command. Think about it, people. This was a solemn occasion which was taken in seriousness and probably in a lot of fear of this Lord, this master who had been dealing heavy blows to the gods of Egypt that they were just now coming in contact with for the first time. So understand spiritually that you must eat the entire lamb. That's the second key and it's a critical key. Yeshua also instituted another ceremony at his last Passover meal, the night before his death, which was the drinking of his cup. This wine of the new covenant represents his blood, the lamb's blood, now being poured out for our salvation in reality. The new birth transfer, transfers you and I from the sinful nature of mankind, symbolized by the blood of man that are born into this fallen world, into the new spiritual life of the resurrection, with the exchange of your dirty, um, sin-filled blood for the sinless blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. It's, it's amazing to see, and, and He is worthy. John 6.53 John 6:53. We're going to dig into this. This is this is there's a lot here. He says, Yeshua said unto them, "Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed." Sad that most of modern Christianity has been given the wrong formula of salvation, a half partial formula of salvation. They, they have seen the blood of the Lamb as an important thing to believe on, especially when they are promised to escape the plague of death, but they have not eaten all the Lamb's flesh. For all true spiritual Israel, to be covered by the blood is not enough. No, you must eat all the Lamb to qualify as His true disciple, ready to leave Egypt at the Feast of Love and Bread. What would have happened if Israel used the blood of the lamb on the outside of their doorpost, then refused to eat all the lamb on the inside of their homes? Thinking, well, he's going to pass by. We've got the blood. It's covered. We're covered by the blood. We sing the songs. We're covered by the blood. There's power in the blood. And that's true. Then they went inside their homes and they, they disobeyed him in eating the flesh of the lamb. Hmm. I think they had been disqualified for the journey ahead. I think they would have probably not made it out of Egypt without it. Don't we see this play out in modern Christianity today where people make the mental ascent of accepting the blood for salvation but fail to follow through with the qualification of real relationship where His sacrifice will sustain us until we finish the race. Most of Christianity accepts the blood for salvation yet refuses to ingest the entire lamb which is the empowerment for the long journey of sanctification. Sanctification meaning purification and consecration. We sing songs about the blood, the power of the blood, but we are ready to eat the but are we ready? But are we ready to eat the lamb and come out of Egypt? This is the meaning behind 2 Timothy 3 starting in verse 1. 2 Timothy 3 starting in verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Folks, these are those times. If these aren't perilous times, I don't know what is. For many have a form of godliness on the outside while denying the true power of godliness, which is a sinless, spirit-led walk out of Egypt, out of the life of sin. Instead of turning away from such, like the Word says, from such turn away. Instead of turning away from these people that have a form of godliness but deny the true power, Knowing that bad company corrupts good character, we have filled our churches with forms of godliness as the norm. It's very sad. 
So let's look at a let's look at a great example. Um, a great example on the absolute importance of eating the entire lamb. John six, John six, John six verse one. After these things. Yeshua went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Yeshua went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And here's a good key here. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. So the Passover, a feast, was nigh. Then Yeshua then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him. He saith unto Philip, When shall we buy, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. So, you see, this is great. Yeshua is getting ready to, to teach this multitude, all who would be celebrating the Passover in just a few days' time, the true meaning and fulfillment of that shadow that they've celebrated in the Passover lamb. He was going to teach the very Passover in a parable of himself, the bread of heaven, who is more than enough for all who choose to partake of him. Yeshua is the only bread that sustains true life. There's no other name. There's no other name. That's going to cost you to believe that. It's going to cost you to say that and to, to believe and act upon that in this world we're in now. He continues in verse 7. This is powerful. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And that was what Jesus was looking for. Yeshua says, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number of about 5,000. This specifically says the men. I mean, I'm not sure exactly, I mean, if it's just men or, I mean, how many people were, were there? 5,000 men for sure. And Yeshua took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, these people had a feast in the wilderness, and they were filled. And he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, nothing to be lost. Therefore they gathered them together, and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. So I hope you're paying attention because there's a pop quiz. So 5,000 men sat and eat of the bread that Yeshua fed them. They would all start to say that he was the prophet that had come, as according to the prophecy of Deuteronomy 18, and try to make him king by force. And he knew, knew that. So Yeshua goes on to say, Yeshua left them and departed into the mountain alone. If you read on, the disciples start across the Sea of Capernaum, uh, the start across the sea to Capernaum, Capernaum. Yeshua meets them on the water, and they arrive immediately on the other side. The crowds of people also cross the sea and come to Yeshua, and they ask, we'll pick up in verse 25, And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? And Yeshua answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, You seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perish but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. So Yeshua reveals the motives of the masses who have sought him out, which still rings true today. They seek him not because of the miracles he did, but because he fed their flesh. That's why it's a wicked generation that seeks a sign. We talked about that last time. He's not going to give you more signs and miracles than he's already given by his death, burial, and resurrection. How many churches today are filled with the masses looking for more, no more than physical bread, prosperity for their flesh to feed their materialism? How many wolves in sheep's clothing have flooded into churches that are now nothing more than social clubs and contact, contact lists for their multi-level marketing schemes? How many think Jesus is nothing more than a type of Santa Claus, a way to get their wish list fulfilled in this life now, as long as they keep a checklist of good deeds and they're not naughty? How many church leaders have loved the growing numbers of the masses who do not come for Yeshua's true meat, because they know that he would, they would leave, but for the stale and maggot-filled false bread of religion that helps build their megachurches and not the true remnant church of Yeshua? We have had stead, a steady diet of the promise of peace and prosperity fed to us for the many fault, from the many false teachers, preachers, and prophets who have fleeced the sheep for their own gain, giving messages that tickle the ears now for generations. It's time to choose the lamb, people. 
but you must eat all of it. See, that's the catch. You can't just take a little bit of it. You can't just take five minutes of the word here and skip the word for four days and come eat, you know, listen to it for 10 minutes on your way to work. No, it's time to choose Yeshua's word over any man's or you will not make it through what lies ahead. And I know many of you um, who say you're disciples, uh, the only word you get is 30 minutes at church where you go sit and listen to a man who's reading a book. I mean, I know there's some, I know there's some good people that are honest and really trying to pastor and, and teach in this hour. But I'm telling you, there's many, because Yeshua said so, many false teachers and many false prophets will rise and deceive many. That's what he says in Matthew 24. So I believe we're in those times right now where many have risen and deceived many and are deceiving many. And so the many pastors that are being the deceivers, um, they're not eating the word for themselves either. They're going and reading a book and from Oprah's book club, from Joel Osteen and, and T.D. Jakes, and then they're going back and teaching their church. And uh, it's easy. It doesn't take them much time. They can play golf the rest of the week. But um, if you don't read the word for yourself, I'm telling you, and this is not just me, this is the word, you will not make it through what lies ahead. You will not make it. And you better take that to heart. I hope you do. Know what happens when true bread is offered versus the stale maggot-filled bread of the flesh. Notice what, what happens here. In verse 47, Yeshua, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Well, I've heard that before. He that believeth on me will have it everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Yeshua said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. No life in you. You're a dead man walking. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Talk about abiding in the vine. Abiding in the vine is eating the lamb. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he, hath, so he that eateth me, he even he shall live by me. By what? By eating me. By eating my flesh. This is the bread. This is the bread, that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. Here he, he reemphasizes that again. He that eateth this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples when they heard this said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? Who can hear it? Meaning who can obey it? Who can, who can understand this and do it? Who can eat him? Here Yeshua reveals that those who believe upon Him have eternal life. But what does believing upon Him entail? See, we, we've got to get past this, this false understanding we have in modern day Christianity. True believers will eat His flesh and drink His blood as, they, as the sign of believing in Him. That is the sign that they believe in Him. They take all of Him. I mean, every bit of it. The, not just the happy times, but the trials. Not just the resurrection, but the cross and the death. All of him. They will devour the entire lamb if they're true disciples. He says in, in verse 58, He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. The Christian culture in America has taken John 3.16 as their mantra. And you can pretty much go ask anybody on the street, and the only scripture they all know is John 3.16. Because they're all taught that from childhood, and that's the only one that makes it out of childhood into adulthood, because it's easy. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe upon Him should not perish but have everlasting life. But they never finish it. They, they use that as their mantra. They put it on t-shirts and hats. Football players, professional football players, put it under their eyes. They paint it on their eyes on Sundays and play football. But the masses have not understood the meaning of what actually believing on Jesus means. It's very important that you understand what believing on Him means. This false gospel has been dr the driving force behind the masses flowing into modern Christianity. Because when the true word is given, the majority will turn away, as, as Yeshua showed right here in His word. So how about we look at the entire context really quickly of John 3.16. 
because it pretty much says the same thing, but Yeshua is going to really dive in more to what that means. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's exactly what He said, Yeshua said, in the text we just read in John 6. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Let's go on. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he that not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of, of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. See, that's what believing on Him looks like. Believing on Him means they come to the light, and their deeds are changed and transformed into the, light of, into the, the deeds of light, the, the true deeds of Yeshua. They trade their dark, deeds of darkness for the deeds of light. That's believing on Him. And the condemnation, He didn't come to condemn them. They're self-condemned, is what the Word teaches. Because everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. And that word reproved means convicted, told a fault, or rebuked. Um, we, we've done that, and pretty much every time we, we speak a word to someone that says they're our brother and sister in the faith, we give them a, the word with a, with a loving rebuke, um, we're hated in return almost every time. Why? Because people have not understood true biblical love and what rebuke and chastisement looks like out of a spirit of love. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest. That word manifest means rendered apparent, shown fully in the light that they are wrought, wrought meaning done as a task or an occupation, that they're done in God. It's huge to understand this. Believing in Yeshua is action. Believing is action. Faith is doing. Um, it's you are condemned by saying you believe in Him while you live in darkness. That's the condemnation. He came in the world to give you life. But you have to believe on Him to obtain life. By not believing on Him or obeying and doing what He says to do, which we're going to dive into more in John here, then you are not believing on Him and your, your works are darkness. And so you remain in your darkness. You don't come to the light because you know that if you come to the light, you will be reproved and your darkness will show. And it will have to be dealt with. So many people just hide um, as they have a form of godliness. They deny the power thereof. So, as Yeshua explained, believing is doing, and unbelieving is not doing. Anyone who does truth comes to the light that his deeds may be made known, that they are in line with the word of the Lamb. All who believe upon him eat all of his words and do them. And they're the ones given eternal life because they are transformed into his image, kind of like the understanding, you are what you eat. The church has watered this down to mean belief is as simple as speaking words with no action. Just an abstract thought, like one would believe in Santa or, or the Easter Bunny or the satanic magic in Disney that just says, just believe and repeat it. Believe, believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. Just shut your eyes and believe his, He is real and you will be saved. No action to prove your faith. Believing is action. People, that is a false gospel. that You can do nothing but just believe, just an abstract thought that doesn't bring anything into reality, because faith becomes reality when it's acted upon. Believing is action. It is obedience to His words. That's why you must eat His words to know His word, so you can do His word. It is not a passive and lukewarm gospel. Going your own way of self-righteousness will still be considered lawlessness when compared to Yeshua's way. And it's why so many would rather surround themselves with like ideology as it strengthens them to remain in their sin and keeps them in a self-righteous standing as they compare themselves amongst themselves. I love this quote from Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, a Russian poet, of the, it's called The Voice of the 20th Century or The Consciousness of the 20th Century. Um, read a lot of his stuff. There's some good stuff there. Um, he says, to do evil, a human being must first of all believe that what he's doing is good. Ideology. That is what gives devil-doing its long-sought justification and gives the evildoer the necessary steadfastness and determination to stay in their deeds. That is a social theory which helps to make his acts seem good instead of bad in his own and others' eyes. So that, so that he won't hear reproaches and curses, but will receive praise and honors. That's, that's what Yeshua, I believe, is talking about. When you don't come to the light, 
when you don't come to the light so your deeds can be made manifest and may be made known? You'd rather sit back in the darkness and stay in the, in, with your dark deeds and, and keep yourself with a standard of your, of your friends and your family and your neighbors and, and the people that are still living in darkness themselves? Because you know if you take a, a different step towards the light, it's going to start peeling off of you and you're going to start losing your life. That's the truth. But people would rather surround themselves with others who also have this form of godliness, content to hang out on the outside of the light with the masses who refuse to walk fully in the light, which will manifest their deeds according to the standards of the word and not the herd. So will you live according to the word or the herd? That's the question, especially in this hour, because the herd is about to stampede in fear. The herd is getting worked up into a panic and a frenzy as the news comes on every night and they say words like the COVID-19 killed this many today. Killed. And we are at war with this outside enemy. I mean, they're, they're, they're beating the drum of panic and fear. Who are you going to serve? Fear or faith. So back to eating the lamb. This, 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 this topic, eating the lamb. You know, many could not hear the spiritual meaning of these words then. And even the day's Catholic Church actually believed that the store-bought wafer and cup of wine literally becomes miraculously transformed into his real flesh and his real blood at communion. I don't know if you knew that, but that's true Catholicism. Um, that you become a cannibal? Did Yeshua tell us to be cannibals? If so, he is just another false priest of Baal who ate the flesh of the children that they sacrificed. No, he spoke spiritually, but flesh cannot understand spirit. That's why he spoke in parables, because flesh cannot understand spirit. 61, when Yeshua knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, see, he offers his disciples some meat and some understanding that the world, the world can't get. Did this offend you? What, what, and if ye, what and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is a spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. They are spirit and they are life. The words. Here he reveals the meaning of the flesh and blood as food, the food parable. That it's his words that are spirit and life. His words are flesh. We must eat and become. This means that whosoever will hear and obey his words, eating all of them, even though they will be mixed with bitter herbs, even though they will mean some suffering and some pain, and they will not always be pleasant, not always be easy, but will, they, they will have eternal life. The ones who take all of the lamb are the only ones who are promised eternal life. Anyone who would see eternal life must eat all of the lamb, every bit of it. This is what believing upon him looks like. If you don't eat his word daily, you don't believe upon him. And that's the bottom line. If you don't eat his word daily, if you're not meditating on his word daily, if he's not in everything you do, if he's not in your thoughts, your goals, your motives, if he's not your life, if he's not your way, your truth, and your life, if you've not sold out everything for the pearl of great price, the Bible's really clear. You have not believed upon him. You've accepted a Jesus that's a form of godliness, but it's not the Jesus of Scripture. There's time to repent. The good news is, there's time to repent. But it's going to repent means you're going to turn. You're going to make a you're going to make a 180. You're going to walk the other way. You're going to leave the broad way of destruction for the narrow path. This is sad. Look at 66, verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They walked no more with him. He lost many disciples who left and walked no more with him. That's what's going to happen if I walk into a mega church and I speak, you must eat his flesh and drink his blood. They're going to clear the pews, man. That's why I don't get invited to mega churches. That's why I don't get invited to many churches, even little churches, because the truth will turn the masses away. And the masses pay the bills, let's face it. Then, 67, then said Yeshua unto the twelve, will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, and this is important, Master, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. The words of eternal life. 
It's still this way today. The masses will turn away at the message of the Lamb. But as true disciples will stay the course of the narrow path, dragging their cross behind them and leaving everything, everything for the call. Do you understand that Peter got it? Look at what he said again. Get this into your spirit. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. See, that's the choice. You're either going to go to the Lamb because you know He has the words of eternal life, meaning you've got to accept His words and do His words for that eternal life. Or you're going to turn to the many false prophets and teachers of this hour who are going to give you false words and, and the her heretical, um, blasphemous words that divide Scripture wrongly for their own gain. The masses of professing Christians the fair-weather warriors who rely on watered-down, mealy-mouthed, 30-minute motivational speeches they call preaching at church will soon walk away when their idols are shaken. And that time's coming. When going to church brings no profit, no friends, no more gain, no petting of the flesh, no itching the ears to justify disobedience, the masses will be running back into the very arms of Egypt who is promising them the bread and fishes. The liquor stores and marijuana dispensaries will continue to stay open as essential businesses because the masses of people who will turn to them for false comfort instead of the narrow path of the Lamb which will lead them to true life. Remember how many baskets of barley loaf, loaf fragments were left over and collected? How many baskets of barley loaf fragments were left over? Remember I said I was going to give you a pop quiz. He filled 12 basketfuls of barley loaves, but it appears there were no fish left over. This is analogous of the continued bread, which is Yeshua. He is the bread of life, not the fish of life. He was never called the fish of life. He is the bread of life, though, and so there were 12 left over. Why were there 12 baskets of bread left over, and who were they for? Have you thought about that? Why 12 baskets, and who were they for? Well, was it for the, the 5,000 plus who just walked away? Was it for many of the disciples, many of the disciples who left him? Was it for them to have continued bread? Or were they fed one time? in their flesh, and they walked. I believe this was a symbol of the sustaining bread that are given to the ones who will stay with him on the journey. The 12 disciples that stayed till the end, the 12 baskets were for the 12 disciples. The masses went elsewhere for their flesh. But the 12 who believed upon Yeshua's words as being the very bread of life is who the 12 baskets of bread will be given to, spiritually speaking, meaning their cups will be overflowing with the very words of life. It will never go dry. The bread will never run out. It's why Yeshua instructed us to ask the Father in Matthew 16, 6, 11, Matthew 6, 11, to give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. He didn't say, give us this day our 30 minute watered down sermon for the week. And then we're gonna go back and live our lives as we want. For our goals, having what we desire, speaking positive mental attitude, assent speeches, to, to, to justify our disobedience in eating the lamb and suffering. And remember, not only that, but remember how he overcame the temptation of Satan in the wilderness when Satan asked him to turn these stones into bread. He said, with the word of his testimony, with the word of his testimony, Matthew 4, 4, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. More proof that the analogy of bread is, is the words, the very words of Yeshua. How many of you who claim to follow Yeshua will even in this time turn to Facebook, entertainment, music, and Hollywood instead of falling on your knees and committing yourselves to reading and doing His Word daily? I can't tell you the number of professing believers that have told us over the years that they have no time for study. No time to really ingest the words of the Lamb because of all of the distractions and idols in their lives. I know many who only get the Word every Sunday. And they admit it. Many who only read what others say about the Word in their daily five-minute devotionals that come through on their email. That's their Word time. Then there is another, the other extreme of the self-proclaimed truth seekers who study hours and hours and become sheer Gnostics, worshiping knowledge over the Lamb, which has led to their eventual all-out denial of Him in many, many ways and, and many times. That is because it's not the hearers of truth only, but it's the doers of Yeshua's words of life that will not be deceived in this hour. It's, and and self-deceived, the Word says. It's the, the doers of the Word, and not the hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Matthew 7, 21. This is, this is powerful. This, this ought to keep you up at night. Not everyone that saith unto me, Master, Master, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. 
Many will say to me in that day, Master, Master, have we not professed, prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works, miracles even? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, iniquity, sin, lawlessness. So, as we discussed in part one, the masses who seek the signs and wonders yet refuse to eat the lamb are the very ones who have had a form of godliness yet deny the true power thereof in this day and age. The power is the transformational new life that is given to all of those who become like Yeshua through the eating of his flesh and the drinking of his blood daily. It's very important. Yeshua goes on to explain. Verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, now we're going to tie it into the words, right? Because he just said, um, 721, he started out, it's those who do the will of my Father. Then he, then he digs in a little deeper to, to reveal what he's talking about plainly. Verse 24, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken unto him, unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. See, great is the falling away that's coming. Great's the falling away, because the many, the many have refused to do, and only hear, and only hear, being hearers only. See, loving the truth, so that you are not given the delusion in the last hour, is loving Yeshua. He is the truth, who is the way, the truth, and the life. It's loving Him. If you say you love Him, but refuse to do, do His words of truth, you don't love the truth. Bottom line. If you fail to love your enemies, bless those who curse you, lay your life down by loving your neighbor as yourself, preach the true gospel that causes some to reject and hate you, take up your cross daily and follow him, dine to your flesh every day, forsaking everything for him, feasting upon the lamb daily, just to name a few, just to name a few. You have until now been only building upon the sand. How can you expect to see him and know what to do without knowing His words for yourself. It's like having a relationship where you don't talk. How are you going to know your spouse if you never talk? How can you call yourself the bride of Yeshua when you don't need His word? How can you expect to see Him face to face and be accepted as His bride without a personal relationship, hearing His words, longing to sit at His feet, hearing from Him, and doing, having the heart to do what He tells you to do. Don't deceive your own selves. All who love Him will do, knowing first that before they can do, they must know His words of life to know what to do. You must fully understand that the coming deception is a spiritual mandate from the Creator of heaven and earth, poured out on all who will not love the truth, meaning they will refuse to obey the truth. There will be absolutely nothing you can do about it. N no way of not falling for the lie as it will be an automatic consequence for the masses who heard the word but refused to do it, along with all of those who claimed the blood but refused to daily eat the entire lamb. Once diluted, you will become joined with the ecumenical one-world rebellion of the earth, who will be changed, joining together in a newly fused social one-world religion that they might even call some sort of New Age Christianity, a New Age Christ, with other Christ that come and join like they already see have now. <clears throat> if you do not read the Word for yourself daily, I'm going to just tell you like it is. If you do not read the Word, if you don't ingest the Word, if you don't feed upon it, if you don't abide in Him, meaning you've, you're, He's in you and you're in Him, and that happens by through the Word, through the Spirit. If you don't abide in the vine, you will be part of the falling away. You will be, and there is no way around it. There's no way, no matter what you say, and you might sit there right now and say, it'll never happen to me. It'll never happen to me. Well, if you don't look at the example of Israel, how their bodies littered the desert when they refused to do the truth and obey, when they refused to have faith, their bodies littered the desert, and most of them didn't, that, that generation didn't make it 
to the promised land. If you don't understand what that's showing you, the symbol, if you think that all those people were just silly, stupid, you know, backwards, um, desert dwellers of the past, no, they saw, they tasted the manna from heaven. They saw the miracles. They saw the mountain on fire. They experienced the deliverance from Egypt. And if those people can fall away and deny Him, who are you to th sit there in your pride and your arrogance and say that you won't ever be deceived, that you won't be deluded? I'm telling you, it's, you, can't, you can't stop it from happening because it's going to be a spiritual, it's in the Word, and it will come to pass, a spiritual mandate from heaven itself. If you hate the truth by not doing it, you will be given the delusion. And the word delusion means that even in the face of irrefutable evidence, you will believe the contrary. I won't be able to talk you out of it. You won't be able to talk yourself into it. It's going to be that bad of a lie that sweeps the entire earth. And it's here, people. It's here. I'm begging you, man. If you, if you call yourself a Christian, you better get in the Word. You better repent. You better ask the Father what to repent from and of. You better, you better let your idols fall. You better humbly ask Him to inspect you. You better draw near the light. Many have been taught a gospel, a good news, which requires no real action. That's the bottom line. The truth is that there is good news for all who will believe in Yeshua. But our enemy has changed the very words and the meanings of our language so that most are blind to the true gospel and what the true gospel entails. Here is some gospel. The good news of the lamb that was slain. Let me give you some. Do you know that Yeshua gave a, 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 a formula? He gave a for, you, you like formulas? You're looking for formulas? He gave a formula to escape the fear and reality of eternal death. The formula to leave Egypt, spiritual Egypt, and the coming plagues and judgments that are pouring on the earth even now. The very formula to overcome sin. You want to know what it is? Matthew 16, 24. Then said Yeshua unto his, his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. See, it's backwards. It's backwards than you've believed. Many of you believe. It's backwards than you've been taught from, from a kid in school where you can have your best life now. See, it's backwards from what you've been taught that you can, when you graduated and you got all these, these graduation cards that says, go for the stars. Do whatever you want. Be all you can be. Join the army. Do all these things, all this propaganda that tells you that you're in control, that you captain your ship, and that you can do anything you want in life. You can have anything you put your mind to. You can achieve whatever you believe. You know what? It's a, it's a lie from the very pit of hell, given to you from the very en enemy of your Creator who wants you to serve Him as the only sovereign and living God. It's very simple, but it's very hard. It's very simple in the fact that only those who deny themselves their flesh, their motives, their desires, their own goals, etc. Number two, those who take up their cross, accepting the way of suffering even unto death. He promised you're going you're gonna to take that cup. If you believe in Him, you will take that cup of suffering. Following him, Number three, following Him along the trail that He is on. Not your own trail, not your own way, not having what you want in life, not, not directing your own life, people, but, but asking Him, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done. Father, what is your will for my life? Not what my will is. Not my will of materialism. Not my will of retirement goals. Not my will of where I want to live and what I want to do with my time. What is your will for the, 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 the span of life you've given me between the two bookends of birth and death? Because people, it's fleeting. It's very fast. And you're, you're going to enter death really quickly. All of us will. It's what you do for him that remains. Only the, only the Word will remain. So only the Word that you've ingested and become like will remain. Everything else will, is as grass and fades as the flower and will be consumed by the fire. The true gospel is losing your life to find His, denying yourself to follow Him. This is the true gospel. If the gospel you've accepted does not include bitter herbs, and the acceptance of the cross to follow Him out of Egypt, then you have not been given the true gospel. 
If your gospel lets you simply take the blood by word only without taking his way of suffering, then you have believed a lie. If you say you have been born again, but your life still looks exactly the same as before, then you have not believed upon the true Yeshua of life. And His Word has not changed you because you're not in His Word. And neither do you know His Word. So guess what? The Word says you don't know Him. And I'm telling you, this is a hard rebuke to many of you, but it's, it's love. It's the Father through the, by the Spirit chastising those who claim to be sons. He wants to give you the chance for sonship. Sadly, the many, the many, the masses will turn away. Matthew 7, 13. He says, Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to lot to destruction, and many there be which go in thereby. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. See, these aren't my words. I'm not making this up. I'm not trying to make it so complicated that I'm not trying to make a little club where I'm exclusive, like I've been told. We are exclusive. No, the Word is exclusive. The Word is exclusive. Yeshua and His remnant, Yeshua's choice of who comes in to His kingdom is very exclusive. And you must read it and understand it. What is Yeshua saying here in the Scripture? What is the straight gate? The straight gate, straight, that Greek word is stenos. stenos. It means narrow. And the, the definition, from obstacles standing close about. So it's narrow from the obstacles that are standing all around you. You're having to go through obstacles, people. See, he is saying that the gate you enter into life at is the narrow way, with many obstacles laid about. It is not going to be easy. He goes on to say that the narrow is the way leading to life. That word for narrow is thlebo. Thlebo, T-H-L-E-E, bo, thlebo. It means afflict, narrow, throng, suffer, tribulation, and trouble. That's some of the definitions. This is why the path has been so hidden. Because the many false teachers who do not teach the truth of the way to life, that is thlebo, narrow, throngs, suffer, and tribulation, and trouble. With many obstacles where you will suffer tribulation and trouble, part of the refinement, people. Yeshua himself said that few will find it. That word for few here means literally puny. A puny number will find it. Puny. Doesn't that... I mean, people, do you understand what this is saying? It's saying that only a remnant will be saved. A remnant that choose to follow him. The masses are going to turn away. Just like in the story I just read you in John 6. Matthew 21, starting in 1. And Yeshua answered and spake unto them by, again by parables. And he said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king. Now, this is after his triumphal entry. Again, we're talking about Passover season here. Passover is this next week, for the calendar we keep that we're on. And then we'll start the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so, um, this is... Uh, I'm, I'm taping this on uh, April the 5th. So, Passover's coming up. And uh, so, the very week Yeshua rode in um, on his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he goes to the temple and he's teaching in, the, in these parables. And he says, verse 2, the kingdom of heaven, 22, uh, verse 2, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king which made a marriage of his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth another ser other servant, saying, Tell them what you're bidden. Tell them what you're invited. Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed. All the things are ready. Come unto the marriage. Come. But they made light of it. They went their ways. One to his farm. Another to his merchandise. So think about that. They made light of it and went their ways. One to his farm, his work, his, his daily chores, his mundane you know, life. Another to his merchandise. They refused the marriage supper for their buying and their selling. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. Means they abused them and they killed them. Seven. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Well, you got to ask yourself, what's he talking about here? 
What's the context of the scripture? In the very temple he's sitting in as he's teaching it right before his Passover, right before they're going to kill him as the lamb. Remember, it's important that we take his word in context. Who were the people that were invited to the wedding feast and made light of it, killing the servants, the prophets, the many that came, including John the Baptist, that the king sent again and again and again? It was Pharisaical Judaism, the very false religion that was controlling the very temple that Yeshua was speaking in when giving this parable. The very false religious leaders who had refused to hear from Yahweh and had turned instead to what they said was the oral Torah, that nothing more than the traditions of men taught by doctrines of devils and the interpretation of the rabbis that would soon be compiled in what today is known as the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud. I know this will go against many generations of Christian Zionist teachings as we've been deceived by, but he is speaking in this parable to the same people and of the same people he was speaking in in the very one before this one in the parable of the tenants in Matthew 21 where he reveals even more where he said while prophesying about his soon death that these Pharisees of Judaism would even kill the very son of the master of the house who had planted the vineyard look at what he says the creator of all the, 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 the master of the house the Father sent a son. And look at what he says. Matthew 21, 37. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will receive, reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, the husbandmen are the workers of the husband, man, the, the householder. They are working the fields for the house, the one that owns the vineyard. They said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. We want the power. We want the control. They already had the temple. There's a, there's a lot we can say, and I've, I've taught on it before, and there's other teachings on it. Um, the time of Yeshua, the, the Zadok priesthood had been fleeced and kicked out and, um, and, and escaped into the desert. Um, there was a false priesthood in place. Verse 39, And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When ma the master thereof of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto these husbandmen? Well, the one in the, in the hearing in the temple, they said unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Very prophetic. Yeshua said unto them, Did you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Yahweh's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. He's basically saying, What's happening is in your eyes, before your eyes now. Therefore I say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof, just as they prophesied out of their mouth. Other husband, husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. That's who the kingdom should be given to. And whosoever shall fall on this stone, the stone, the rock of offense, shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. See, the difference is humility versus pride. The humility will run to the rock and be broken upon it. The proud will lift their heads up and will be crushed to the powder. When the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spoke of them. The leaders, the chief priests, and the Pharisees that were in the temple that would kill the very living Son of God in just a few days perceived they spoke of them. You know why? Because he was speaking to them. And when the chief, and, but they sought to lay hands on him, and they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. The false mixture of Babylonian paganism and the false oral law of Moses, and you need to maybe understand this, and maybe you don't, uh, and I've, I've been with um, different, different um, congregations of the last few years, and many of them definitely understand the oral law of Moses, but um, so what we have is the written law, right? So what we have in the Bible is the written word, the written law. And which the modern day, most modern day Pharisaical Judaism denies. They don't. They don't. They don't believe the written word. The written word is not for them. They have taken the commands and the oral Torah. They believe that Moses was given oral traditions and and instructions that were passed down to them, the keepers of it, from generation to generation to generation, so that now they can give their wisdom unto you. Is that the word? Do you see that anywhere in the word? He gave them two Torahs. One was written, and he just instructed Moses all these things not to write down that only a select few could have that could control the earth with these, this oral hidden Torah. No. 
But that's what happened at the time of Yeshua. That's what controlled the temple. That's what usurped the priesthood almost 200 years before Jesus even came to the earth. And it has continued into this very day. He came to his own, and his own killed him. And the kingdom was taken from them according to Yeshua's own words. I'm not saying it. I just read it to you out of the word. But who will you believe? See, will you believe them? Will you believe him? I say all, the, I say all this because there is a massive movement deceiving people to leave Yeshua and his new covenant sealed in his blood to return to the very law of Moses, even claiming to be Torah observant, which in Judaism, Torah observant means you agree to observe every word of the Torah. Well, there's a lot of the Torah people aren't doing, so they, they, but they're calling themselves Torah observant. Ironically, many in this movement are basing their very interpretations of Scripture from the very system that killed the Lamb of the living God. As they re revere the teachings of the rabbis in the Babylonian Talmud that they call the sages, the wise ones, to be spiritually conceived, while they denigrate the very living word they say they believe in. I have had personal experience in this movement and have tasted the fruit myself, and it is a part of the last day deception and delusion sweeping the earth. So I say this so you can beware. There's ditches on both sides of the narrow path. The common thread with most people who eventually deny Yeshua is the teaching of Christian Zionism, where the third and fourth generation of Christians have been deceived through prophets and teachers who have twisted the scriptures to make the mostly atheistical Zionist agenda seem to be uplifted and confirmed through the prophecy of the very Bible that they don't believe in. I've personally known people who've denied Yeshua after spending time gleaning amongst the rabbis. I've spoken to many who believe Paul to be a liar who is coming in with a satanic spirit to deceive the church so they can be lawbreakers. There are many people that I know currently who have chosen to follow the teachings of a heretic who I called out as a heretic um, who told my wife and I personally as well as many people who attended his local fellowship that he is the Moses of this generation called to lead people back to the mountain of Moses so that they could hear the Torah, the law of Moses. Many people, after reeling from the disillusionment of modern-day Christianity, modern-day powerless Christianity, are jumping from the frying pan into the fire. Out of a sincere search for true obedience, many begin leaving the reality of the blood of Yeshua, the blood of the Lamb, given to set us free from the law of sin and death and return to the shadow. The system put in place that was only put in place until the time of Reformation. That time of Re Reformation is the new life that has come from the very Son of the living God. The hour is very late, people. That's why I say these things. But right now there is still no time, there is still time to repent, to return to Yeshua, to choose Him, to come back to your first love, to choose the Lamb, His way, and to forsake anything that speaks against the words of the Lamb, to reject anything, any tradition, any words, any people, any ministry, if they reject the word of the Lamb and they take doctrines of demons, which is anything that goes against the word, any heresy, any division that's not rightly divided, so it brings a division because it speaks against the truth of his word. At the same time, many Gentiles in modern Christianity who have been offered the, the engrafting into the vine along with true spiritual Israel will try to come into the wedding feast without the proper clothing and will be found naked as Yeshua is appearing. Let's pick back up with this story, um, with our parable in Matthew 22, starting in 7. And we're wrapping up. We're almost done. So hang with me. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they were bidden. They who were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways, and gathered together all of his many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. Folks, this is the time of the Gentiles that the word prophesied of for many, many years. He would pour out his spirit, and that the, 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 even the heathen nations, even the uncircumcised, would be brought into his tabernacle, in Yeshua, in him, and be grafted in in him. When the king came to see the guest, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how come thou hither without a wedding garment on? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, and few are chosen. 
You see, many are called and few are chosen. Many are hearers of the word only. They have heard the gospel, but they have refused to obey and therefore will not be chosen. Many have been called to the wedding feast of the Lamb, but they will not be chosen because they have not believed His words. They have not taken His words. Many will not be chosen because they have not been the bride called chosen and faithful, making herself ready for the groom, keeping their, him, herself pure and clothed with the very, very wedding garment given, the, the wedding garment of righteousness that the King Himself provides His righteousness, His own robe of righteousness. Many will choose to go back to the farm and their merchandise and miss out on the marriage of the Lamb. Many will choose to hear the words of another, the words of Moses even, or, or one who claims to be him in this hour and will reject the very reality of the fulfillment of the law they say they keep. I'll tell you this, if, there, if you see a growing, a growing movement where many, many people are being drawn to it, that's the sign right there. When, when many people love a movement, you better run from it. That's usually the sign right there. It's a narrow path, people, and few find it. Here is the bottom line. Here is the bottom line, totally revealed by Scripture. You've heard the Scripture. I've not made any of this up. I'm going to give you the point blank bottom line of this message so there is no confusion. No confusion. The majority of every professing Christian alive today will not be saved. The majority of every professing Christian on this earth today, of every various denomination, all the ones, all the denominations who claim theirs is the only way, especially, will not be saved. The majorities of people are on the wrong path right now, and they will choose to save their flesh and deny the living Son of God. Many are on the road leading to destruction right now. The deception is that, is that they think they're walking His path because they're walking a path. And a, a bunch of people are on it with them. And so they think, and I've had people tell me this, how can all they all be wrong and you be right, or they be right? How can a few of you get this information and this whole church be deceived and be wrong? I mean, how can all these people be wrong? Because the Word says that all the, all the many people go in by the wide, broad road. Instead of choosing to lose their life to find it, they choose to find their life. They want their life now, and they lose it. Many are on the road. His, his path I know it's sobering. I know, but the only guarantee that any of us have, myself included, the only guarantee we have is that He will never leave us nor forsake us if we're in Him. But sadly, many will forsake Him. That's the truth. Many will forsake Him. That's the falling away we just talked about. By default, they will all be given the delusion that choose not to love the truth by obeying Him and eating every bit of the Lamb. I'm trying to kind of give this to you in a... Um, a palatable understanding. You can't stop it. If you don't love the truth and choose to eat the lamb, every bit of it, along with the bitterness that comes along with it, you're not going to make it, people. It is for this reason that Yahweh will show mercy to chasten all flesh so that some may humbly repent and accept His way of salvation. Today is the day of salvation, if you can hear. There is still time. It's not over yet, but that day is coming rapidly upon the earth. Once you've been given the mercy to live um, and to repent, you must be given His Spirit of grace. Grace so that you can do all He commands by His Spirit. It is His grace that many, many today have confused with His mercy. But His mercy is running out, and the days of fierce testing are here. But he, he gives His grace to the humble and only delusion and blindness to the proud. And I'm going to speak really, really um, more in depth on the difference in mercy and grace as shown in the children of Israel leaving Egypt next time. I believe the church of Laodicea is a type of mainstream Christianity in the last hours of tribulation that we are walking into currently. This is a wake-up call for all who will be given ears to hear. Compare what Yeshua says to this church with the wedding feast parable that we just discussed the wedding feast being the analogy of the marriage supper of the Lamb, and what will be the noticeable difference of the true bride. Revelation 3.14 And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. 
I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So that because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest thou that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked? I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and with white, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, salve that they may seest. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. That's what he says. Be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The white raiment that Yeshua asked the church of Laodicea to buy from him is none other than the wedding garment of the bride. Notice he said buy because it comes with a price. The price is your entire life for his. We've been taught that love is easy, but Yeshua himself says that those he loves, he rebukes and chastens. So be zealous at his rebuke and repent. Later in the vision of the revelation of Yeshua given to John, we find the fulfillment of the parable of the wedding feast Yeshua taught before his death in Matthew 22. Revelations 19 verse 7 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. His wife did something. She made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. So you can't get the gold tried by fire except by following the way of Yeshua. You, might, you will not be granted the fine linen that's clean and white, the very wedding garment of the bride, if you have failed to walk covered in his robe of righteousness as your covering. Self-righteous won't get you there. Self-righteous will leave you naked and ashamed. Many have been called to the wedding feast, but only those chosen as the bride will enter his chamber as his beloved. All who enter have bought his gold tried by fire. All who enter have to enter by the gold tried by fire. The only real and tangible treasure is his word that is stored in your heart where moth and rust will not destroy where your faith is born and then tested and tried in the very fires of purification. That's what the Bible teaches people. 1 John 2, 3, and we're wrapping up, so hang with me. We're going to recap this in a second. 1 John 2, 3, and hereby we do know that we know Him. Because you want to know if you know Him. Because you want to see Him face to face and have Him say, Welcome, not, I depart from me, I never knew you. Here, here's how you know that you know Him, if we keep His commandments. But he, he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know that we are in him. He that saith, he abideth in him, ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. Did you see, though, he says, Whosoever keepeth his word, guardeth his word, and doeth it, loving his word of truth. In him, verily, is the love of God perfected. Are you afraid? Are you in fear? Because perfect love casts out fear. We're going to talk about that next time, too. Perfect love casts out fear. The perfect love is only perfected in you if you eat his word. That's the only way you're going to get it. You are dest you're, you're going to be um, given fear, and you're going to serve fear no matter what you think, if you de deny his word and don't eat it, you're going to serve fear. You won't have a choice because that is the spiritual mandate coming that's on the earth. If you want to be perfected in the love, it's keeping his word that keeps you from fear. So to recap, Passover is the time for both the blood of the lamb and the full consumption of the lamb. This prepares you for the journey of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the narrow way of the Master. That's it. We'll, we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, and we will not love our lives in the death. This is what Passover and Unleavened Bread point us to as a shadow that is fulfilled only in Yeshua. If you have accepted His blood, the proof is that you will eat the Lamb for yourself and do what His word tells you to follow Him along the full path of refinement 
that all of us who will be the bride will accept willfully. His true bride will be found at His return, keeping His word, which is the only way the true love of God can be perfected in us. People, the mercy that He showed Israel in ancient Israel when they were slaves is He didn't kill them all. The mercy was He, he made no other provision for them but to bring them all out of Egypt, sticking His very uh, fire at cloud and, and um, fire between Egypt and Israel so they could not, so Israel couldn't turn back. That's the mercy. He's not doing that this time. The, mer the mercy has been given if you say you believe in Yeshua. You haven't died. That's the, the mercy is He's given you life in b the blood of Yeshua. Now, grace is you have to do. Grace is He's empowered you to follow Him along this narrow path that leads to salvation. Where you're going to see your, your Savior face to face. But it's only for those who will do. It is sad that the early church was deceived to leave the understanding of the Feast of Yahweh, which teach the full redemptive plan in Yeshua in exchange for an ecumenical traditions and holidays linked with other gods. The church has forgotten the very, very, very powerful commanded remembrances of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread and jumped to a blend of First Fruit Sunday with the spring fertility rites of Ishtar that we know today as Easter. There's a lot there. I'm telling you, I know it's probably going to be offensive to a lot of you. Um, I used to do Easter. I don't do Easter any longer. I, I, I understand what it, what it is, the history of it, and, and uh, I refuse to do it. You will never know the power of the resurrection without the Passover covenant agreement, sealed with your willing partaking of the flesh and the very blood of the Lamb. Many will deny the choice of taking the bread of affliction because they have never been taught the examples of Israel's exit out of Egypt with the Feast of Eleven Bread teaching. They, they, they don't know the walk of sanctification that begins with a choice to accept the bread of leanness over the choice bread of Egypt. See, you must understand His Word. You must rightly divide all of it. You must know all of it. Um, or you will be deceived in this hour because there's many false prophets. You must wrestle with the forever commands. I'm going to leave you with this. You must wrestle with, like I have, like we, many of us that I know have, you must wrestle with the forever commands that Yahweh gave Israel. You, ask, you have to ask yourself, why have we left the commands of forever and replaced them with traditions of men that the Word stands silent on? Exodus 12, 13. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. Speaking of the wrap-up of the Passover message. Meaning a sign, a symbol. And when I, a beacon, a flashing beacon. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you. When I smite the land of Egypt, as, and this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to Yahweh throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an ordinance forever. Le'olam. By it, forever and ever. 23. For Yahweh will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, Yahweh will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. And you shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. 25. And it shall come to pass when you become come to the land which Yahweh will give you, according to as he has promised, that you shall keep this service, this Passover service. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? What are you going to teach your children when you don't know it? You're going to teach your children that you shall say, It is the sacrifice of Yeshua. <laughs> the Yahweh's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. He delivered our houses. Why and how? Because the blood of the Lamb was poured out for you and for me. I pray you'll examine your life by the standard of Yah's Word and compare the walk you are on right now with the one that includes the blood of the Lamb, the eating of the Lamb, and the acceptance of the lean bread of the narrow path to life. We are about to experience the plagues of Egypt on a worldwide scale. We are experiencing a plague now, aren't we? There's a plague in the land now. With the enemy of our Creator seeking to devour His seed from the earth, Yeshua reveals the only way of those who will overcome the Antichrist system of the full divorcement of truth, the only way they can overcome the full divorcement of truth and be given the delusion, when lawlessness and sin rule the day soon to come. Revelations 12, 11. I'll leave you with this. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. 
I believe this is linked into the very first time that Israel overcame the death that was poured out in the, in the shadow of the Pharaoh system in Egypt, which will be a reality of the coming Antichrist kingdom. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb. They sprinkled upon the doorpost before death passed over that night. They overcame by the word of their testimony, meaning they ate the entire lamb with bitter herbs, which we saw in Yeshua's very own words, is the very word of life. The very word that you must live by, and not by bread alone, but the words that have come from heaven, His testimony that you accept, that you deliver verbatim. They ate the entire lamb with bitter herbs, taking their testimony, the entire word of God that Yeshua Himself testified to. And, we leave off this sometimes, they did not love their lives unto death. They chose to leave Egypt for the narrow road of affliction that started with the very Feast of Unleavened Bread, leaving the sure bread of Egypt behind for the Feast of Unleavened Bread journey into the unknown that we all must take by faith. In the next part of the series, we'll pick up with the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the journey of the narrow way. Our prayer is that you would humbly seek His face, and if you have not had a hunger for His Word and His Spirit, that you would seek and ask Him, because He stands at the door waiting to answer all who knock, all who seek. He's longing to give them, He's longing to give you the true treasure, which is Him. Will you ask? Will you seek? Will you knock? Will you accept His, His way? Or will you stay on yours and serve fear? See, the choice is yours right now, but that choice is going away. Choose fear, or you're going to choose faith. Join me next time. We're going to dig into the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Word's going to open up to you, um, and it's, it's going to be amazing. So, until next time.